You may be seated. And as you find your seats, find your way to the end of time, or at least the end of this era in Daniel chapter 12. We're coming near to the end of this great prophet. We're coming near uh, to the end of the era when sinful man governs the earth. I'm reading a book right now on the communist takeover of Cambodia by the Khmer Rouge, begun in the early 1970s. They took the capital, Phnom Penh, in 1975, which ushered in a nationwide reign of terror, turning Cambodia into one giant concentration camp. The Khmer Rouge and the communists under Pol Pot committed the worst genocide in modern history by percentage of population. Cambodia in the 1970s experienced a total breakdown in civilization. The book I'm reading right now is a biography describing the moments when everything came to a halt. Families were torn apart. Plans came to an end. Dreams were shattered. The normal rhythms of life totally upended by the unpredictable terrors of maniacal, genocidal warfare. Few of us have any idea what such a breakdown of civilization would be like, though some in our day have experienced it. I'm drawn to apocalyptic movies, you know, those movies which try to imagine what the end of the world will be like, some nuclear holocaust or cataclysmic asteroid or freezing temperatures, global warming, global cooling, all of them describe some way that Civilization as we know it on a global scale comes to an end and you have these scenes of abandoned cars, no more grocery stores, total global anarchy, lawless gangs roaming about the the remainders of humanity scattered across, uh, across a desolate globe. You see the love of many wax cold and the basic loyalties of even the closest relationships, mothers and daughters and siblings and family relationships and close friends, all of them break down in a mad scramble for survival of humans on the earth. Well, those movies are right about one thing. Worldwide disaster is coming, and a worldwide disaster that will oppress every earth dweller all at the same time. Humanity will experience one common future history, the end of the age as we know it now. I want to turn your attention to Daniel chapter 12. We'll look this evening at the first four verses. And this picks up on the time of the Antichrist that we were looking at last week. Daniel 12 begins this way. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. We have here in these first four verses, very simply, four features of sinful humanity's last days. When you think about man's time on the earth. Man's attempt to run his life like the Tower of Babel, apart from and in rebellious protest against the one true God. What is man's last stand like? You think of Custer's last stand and how that ended. We see, first of all, the great tribulation in verse 1. Daniel writes, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. The your people here is Israel. The sons of your people are the nation of Israel. 
And Michael, the great prince, is the angelic being we've already seen in the book of Daniel, who will stand guard over the people. Verse 1 begins with the phrase, at that time, that is a reference back to chapter 11, beginning in verse 36, all the way to verse 45, the time of the Antichrist we looked at last week. A seven-year period of time where he makes an agreement with the nation of Israel, uh, an agreement for a temporary peace. That time right in the middle at the three and a half year mark, marks a period where that treaty is broken. Antichrist sets up the, the abomination of desolation, sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped in a worldwide religion. That is the time Daniel refers to in chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard. What we see during the great tribulation here in verse 1 is, first of all, a supernatural protection of Israel. A supernatural protection of Israel. Michael here is given as a special angelic protector of the nation. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. The events described here in Daniel are mirrored by what is recorded in the book of Revelation for us. Daniel 12, verse 6, tells us, The woman fled into the wilderness. And the woman here in verse 6 is Israel. We know that from the context. The woman Israel fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she, she would be nourished for 1,260 days. There's that time stamp in the book of Revelation we've already seen in the book of Daniel. 1,260 days or 36 months or three and a half years. This period of time where Israel, after the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, flees into the wilderness. Verse 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael, here's Michael, and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon is Satan. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, power, kingdom of our God, and authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. This scene that Daniel describes here in Daniel chapter 12, and keep your finger in Revelation chapter 12 for just a moment, describes Michael at war with Satan and his angels, and this war is taking place in heaven. And the result of this war is Michael wins and the devil is cast out. This is not the casting down of Satan at the beginning of time at the fall of man. Satan has had access to the throne room of God. You remember this from Job chapter 1. Satan appears before God on his throne room and has the audacity to challenge God's integrity over one of God's faithful servants named Job on the earth. And you know that even now, Satan is the accuser of the brethren who has access to heaven and is able to spit accusations against believers in the very presence of God. None of those accusations can stand. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who makes intercession on our behalf, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.33 says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Nobody, not even the accuser of the brethren, Satan in the very throne room of heaven. But Satan's access to heaven comes to an end in Revelation chapter 12, or in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And that event is in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, when Michael and his angels wage war with Satan and his angels and win. At that point, Satan no longer has access. He is thrown to the earth now look at verse 12 of Revelation 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Okay, this is good news for heaven. Satan doesn't have access here anymore. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That is, he persecuted Israel from whom was Jesus the Christ. 
Verse 14, but the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. There that time, times, and half a time. A time is one year, times is two years, one plus two is three, and half a time is a half a year. Three and a half years, that's the same as what's said up above at 1260 days or three and a half years or 36 months, all describing the same time period. Israel is supernaturally protected from Satan's wrath. Now think about this in the history of the nation of Israel. Israel has had enemies. I believe these enemies have been satanically motivated. Why? Because Satan is angry with the woman who would bear the male child the male child of fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 3.15 that was actually given to Satan personally by God in the garden where God said to the snake, the woman will bear a seed and the seed will crush your head. Satan has been opposed to the woman and her seed from the beginning. Interfering with the seed line in Genesis 6, an enemy of God's people from the beginning of the nation of Israel with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob being murderous of the line of descent of the seed through the line of David. A couple times in the history of Davidic descent, the male offspring came down to one solo child scurried off and rescued from genocidal hatred. You think about when Jesus came to the earth and the murderous attempt by Herod to wipe out all the male children around Bethlehem. All of this is reflective of Satan's great wrath against God's people, Israel. What's interesting is she is carried out to the wilderness. She being Israel, the the woman in Revelation chapter 12, she is protected supernaturally by God from Satan's ravages out into the wilderness. And if you remember last week from Daniel chapter 11, we discovered that several key regions, desert nations, Edom, Moab, and Ammon were preserved from Antichrist's ravage of warfare, Daniel eleven forty one. It is possible that the wilderness described in Daniel or in Revelation chapter 12 is the same as the wilderness uh, refuge of those nations described in Daniel eleven forty one. Whatever the case may be, Israel's protection is sure because God is sovereign. And he is caring for his people because he has a special purpose for the people during this time. And no matter what Satan does, no matter his schemes, no matter the Antichrist's ravages, God will accomplish his purposes for his people. This will be a time of unprecedented affliction. Supernatural protection for Israel, but worldwide unprecedented affliction. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Doesn't mean they're less than 24 hour days. It just means they're limited by God's perfect plan. Exactly the time frame he designed. This period of unprecedented affliction will be the height of mankind's perversity and evil. Be all that you can be. What will humanity be when it could be all that it can be? What will humanity be when it lives up to its perverse and sinful potential? That will be fully on display during the Great Tribulation. It will not just be a time of Satan's wrath against Israel or the outflow of man's man at his absolute worst, but it will also be the time of the outpouring of God's anger in judgment against those who dwell on the earth. And the time frame described in Revelation 6 through 18, which is the unfolding of the details of Daniel's 70th week, describes God's wrath against the earth dwellers. It will be global, cataclysmic, and the outpouring of God's anger against sin. And you might be asking, well, if if the lake of fire, if eternal wrath of God is in place, why should there be some sort of temporal, earthly wrath of God? Have you ever wondered that? Why, Why are there so many chapters about this in the book of Revelation? Why is there such a thing as the great tribulation? 
I believe that God desires to demonstrate to a watching world that he is in charge and that he holds people accountable. Do you remember the proverbial statement in Ecclesiastes 8.11? That though the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to do evil. Right? And you know this in your own home when you were a kid and you got away with something you were more prone to get away with more somethings. And you know this in your parenting. Uh, you, you, you let Johnny get away with something, and Johnny's going to take that and get away with more somethings. And what's tragic about the human condition is God's stay of execution, his delay of divine just punishment against sin is mercy. It's not what we deserve. But humanity takes the mercy of God, the long suffering of God, the patience of God, and makes it an, an excuse to sin more fully. Hey, I got away with stuff. I guess it doesn't matter to God. I guess there's no consequence. I can just do some more. And as Romans 2 delineates for us, every time we sin, it is as if we put more judgment behind the great dam, which is God's mercy. God's mercy holding back a great deluge of judgment for a time. And there is a day coming when the dam will let loose and those flood floodwaters of God's judgment will break forth. And all of man's presuming on God's mercy will be added to the conflagration of wrath that is coming. I believe God has a design to demonstrate his righteous wrath on the earth while sinners are still there. That is one purpose for the great tribulation. To demonstrate that he will keep his promises. His promises for judgment. As well as his promises for grace. I want to read to you some of the descriptions of the great tribulation. Uh, this is not just a Daniel and Revelation reality. Uh, descriptions of the great tribulation occur in the Pentateuch. They occur in the prophets. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament alike. I'll just give you a few highlights. Moses speaks of it in Deuteronomy chapter 4. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and you will listen to his voice. There is a promise from God through Moses before Israel got into the land, before they defected, before they apostatized, before they had failed in keeping up their end of the covenant, before they were exiled, and before they were returned. God knew all of this and made a promise that he would bring them to himself one day after much trouble. That promise of utter ultimate return from the heart level for the nation of Israel is part of the purpose of the great tribulation. We'll come to that in a moment. Isaiah 2, Yahweh of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up that he may be abased. This is in the heart of God to set everything right. Isaiah 2.19 describes this scene. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of Yahweh and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. And this promise from Isaiah is exactly what happens in the book of Revelation. And people go into the rocks and the caves and they even cry out, rocks fall on us which means they would rather die in judgment than repent, which is one of the ongoing themes for earth dwellers in the great tribulation. Even in Revelation chapter 6, when people recognize this is the great day of the wrath of God and of the Lamb, they know where the wrath is coming from, and they still will not let go of their idolatries. 
Isaiah 13 says this, Wail, for the day of Yahweh is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. Behold, the day of Yahweh is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. And he will exterminate its sinners from it. Isaiah 24, 18 says, The windows above are opened, and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder. The earth split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it. And it will fall, never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that Yahweh will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on the earth. And they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. For Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And his glory will be before his elders. Jeremiah 30 records, Alas, for the day is great. There's none like it. It is the time of Jacob's distress. Jacob is a name for Israel. But Jacob will be saved out of it. Joel 2 verse 30 records this. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as Yahweh has said, even among the survivors whom Yahweh calls. And Joel 3, 1 says, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. In all of these reports of the Great Tribulation, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, several things, several themes run all the way through. Rampant human sin, cataclysmic divine judgment, the worldwide scope of destruction, and a very specific purpose for Israel. The purification of Israel, the troubling of Israel. The bringing Israel unto repentance. The spiritual rescue of Israel is one of the primary purposes for the great tribulation. To bring Israel's sin to an end. To bring about Israel's refinement and ultimately to bring about Israel's spiritual salvation. The great tribulation serves as preparation for reception of Messiah as king of the earth. God will break the will of his people. He will keep his promise to circumcise their hearts. He will regather Jews scattered throughout the nations and bring about a national repentance. Listen to Daniel 11.35. We were here a couple of weeks ago. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine and purge and make them pure until the end time stated purpose of this tribulation period is to bring about a purging of the nation of Israel. I want you to turn to a couple of passages that highlight God's judgment and gracious purposes for the nation of Israel, even while he brings cataclysmic judgment to the whole earth. Look at Jeremiah 31. This is a memorable passage on the new covenant. The new covenant is a promise that God made with Israel, new in the sense that it's different from the Mosaic covenant. It's a promise to keep the commitment God made all the way back in Deuteronomy to circumcise the hearts of his people. Jeremiah 31, 31 says it this way. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, 
Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is a promise to bring about spiritual restoration, to bring about regeneration, to bring about a unified heart at a national level for God's people who have been rebellious since their inception. This is a promise that has not yet been fulfilled. This is a promise that is still outstanding. This is a promise for which God's integrity is at stake. Turn to Zechariah chapter 12. How will God fulfill this promise of a new covenant, love for him at the heart level in his people? Look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 8. In that day, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of Yahweh before them. That means the weak will be strong, and the strong will be very strong. This relates to that supernatural protection of the nation in that time that we talked about earlier. In that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. What will happen when God pours out his spirit of grace and supplication on the inhabitants of Jerusalem? They will look on me, that is Yahweh, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This passage is used of Jesus in John 19 and in Revelation 1.7. This me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. For God to pour out a spirit of grace and supplication is for God to go to the house of Israel with supernatural power, cause them to be born again in repentance that produces a sorrow, a mourning, a grief. We crucified our Messiah. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for a lost only son. This is the grief of spirit-born repentance. They will look to Yahweh. They will supplicate. They will ask him. And they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is a remarkable statement. God is going to bring Israel to the place of seeing their obstinacy as a nation, grieving over it, and turning to Christ. I'm about to sneeze. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Prophecy can help with warning of danger, I suppose. We should never think that Israel, in her present condition today, is worthy of God's promises. Some people are confused in this and they think, why would Israel, in all of their recalcitrant, unbelieving rebellion get to have the kingdom. Well, they won't in their current state. Israel will not experience the blessings of the kingdom promised to them until they have a heart softened by God's grace. In other words, nobody gets into the kingdom apart from regeneration, apart from recognizing sinfulness and embracing Jesus Christ as Savior. The reality for Israel and God keeping his promises to them about a kingdom simply means that he will bring about new birth in them at a national level. He will bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. This is why commentators are right to see Isaiah 53 as the future song of repentance of Israel. Who believed our report? Oh, he was crushed for our iniquities. They will sing the servant's song when they were brought by the spirit of grace and supplication to look on Yahweh whom they have pierced. 
they will mourn in repentance. Look down the page of Zechariah 13. Verse 8, it will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third part will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people and they will say, Yahweh is my God. This promised refrain throughout the Old Testament I will be their people and they will be my God. Over and over and over again from God to heartless Israel will finally come to fruition. And it will come to fruition through the troubling of Jacob or as Zechariah 13 says, through the rooting out of two parts in it and a third being left to be refined. Turn to Romans chapter 11. You remember Romans chapter 11 is the culmination of God's defense of his own integrity. The word of God has not failed, Romans 9, 6 says. It should seem like the word of God failed if Israel is separated from her Messiah after all the promises that she received from God. I mean, we get a lot of promises in the book of Romans as believers. If we are to trust Romans 8, then there has to be an answer for the problem of Israel. And Romans 9 to 11 is the answer to the problem of Israel. They're cut off in unbelief. I mean, there are very few Jews in Paul's day who actually believed in Messiah, Paul being one of them. And the threefold answer Paul gives in Romans 9 to 11 for why God's integrity has not failed, even though Israel is cut off, who received the promises about Messiah. That threefold answer is, number one, God always keeps a remnant. Actually, number one is not all Israel is Israel. There is a spiritual Israel within national Israel. Don't be mistaken. Uh, Blood heredity doesn't make you right with God. Doesn't matter who your parents are. Doesn't matter who your lineage is. You must be born again. And there is a spiritual Israel within national Israel. The second reason why God's word has not failed, according to Romans 9 to 11, is that God always keeps a remnant. Proof positive is Paul the apostle. He was a Jew. And he is a faithful remnant within Israel. And God has always kept a remnant. That was true in the Old Testament. It's true today. And the third reason God's word doesn't fail, according to Romans 9 to 11, is God will keep his promises to Israel about a national repentance and heart circumcision. And that's where Romans 9 to 11 concludes. Verse 25 of chapter 11. I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery, brothers, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant, quote of Jeremiah 31, with them, Israel, when I take away their sins... And notice Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, the same they as Israel, from the standpoint of the gospel, present Israel, unrepentant Israel are enemies for your sake, Christian. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What does that mean? God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about a people, a land, a blessing, And those promises unfolded in a national and international blessing through a king. God's going to keep his promises. Israel currently in her unrepentant state is an enemy of the gospel. And yet beloved because God keeps his promises. And so there is a day coming when all Israel will be saved. And that salvation is not a carnal entrance into an undeserved kingdom. It is the fulfillment of God's blessing promises to those who love him from the heart because God will do the supernatural work of heart circumcision in them by bringing them through this great tribulation. Which of the Jews in this last generation will experience this repentance and this salvation according to Daniel 12 all the ones found written in the book, Daniel 12, 1. 
And this reference to books is an Old Testament and New Testament reality. Some have called it the registry of citizenship. That is, those who are written in the book were those who were marked out by God's grace for certain things. This familiar language occurs in the book of Revelation, those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, it is God's own whom he has predestined who will be rescued during that time. By the way, there are Jews and Gentiles who will be saved during that great tribulation. God will bring about people not only of the woman who flees into the wilderness, but as Revelation 12 says, also the rest of her children who keep the commandments of Jesus. A reference to non-Jews who also turn to Christ during that time. A second feature of this last era of mankind is a double resurrection. Look at verse 2 of Daniel 12. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. The hope of the resurrection was the hope of Old Testament saints. Job hoped in this. He said in Job 19, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. At the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. I will behold him and my eyes will see him. Isaiah 26 expressed this, your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. Your dew is as the dew of dawn and the earth will give birth to departed spirits. Paul himself, a believer in this Old Testament promise and appealing on that basis, says in his own defense in Acts 26, I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise he was referring to there is the promise of the resurrection. He said, this promise our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I'm being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God raises the dead? This hope of resurrection is a biblical hope through and through Old Testament and New Testament. And notice what Daniel says. Many of these who sleep will arise to everlasting life. And you're perhaps familiar with this sleep language in the New Testament, a prominent New Testament metaphor for physical death, where the body by outward appearances seems to be sleeping. It's not moving. It's not doing anything. Although the inner man separated from the physical body is very much alive and awaiting physical bodily resurrection. From our vantage point, our loved ones who are with Christ appear to be sleeping. The body's horizontal. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, as the Apostle Paul says. But believers are awaiting the glory of physical resurrection. And the promise here in Daniel 12, 2 answers the concern that Daniel's readers would feel. Will the faithful who die during this worst time in human history, will they miss out on the kingdom and its promised blessings? Could you imagine the urgency of that question? You think of all of the sweep of human history, the anticipation of Messiah's reign. Daniel has talked about that great stone cut out without hands that will come down and smash all the human empires and establish a righteous reign that will last forever. And here are these Jews who believe in Messiah, anticipate his return, become insightful and lead others to righteousness and then are killed. And they almost made it. What of them? And it reminds us of the pressing question in 1 Thessalonians 4 that was on the Thessalonian hearts that Paul sought to answer. I do not want you to be grieved. Here's what happens. And he lays out the eschatology. Here, Daniel is giving similar comfort. There is a resurrection for those tribulation martyrs. They will experience the kingdom bodily. He describes here two kinds of resurrections. Uh, many are described in the life resurrection, but then there are others. These others go to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Again, here the focus of this text is on Israel, and particularly Israel during the tribulation. Daniel 11.35 tells us, Some who have insight will fall. That is, faithful ones who led others to righteousness. And for them is the promise of a resurrection. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. 
These two kinds of resurrections are described there. We get a little more detail about the timing. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, John records, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and they had not received the mark on their forehead or their hand. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There's that same promise. And then Revelation 20, verse 6 said, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in this first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. That is, these tribulation martyrs will experience a bodily resurrection and immediately benefit from the glorious reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years. But Daniel describes a second kind of resurrection here in Daniel 12 too. The second one is a resurrection unto disgrace and everlasting contempt. Disgrace is a word for great shame. It's, a, it's an emphatic form of a word. And contempt is a word for abhorrence. The only other place this word is used in Isaiah 66 to describe the abhorrence of seeing those who endure eternal conscious torment under the justice of God. And so a resurrection to great shame and to abhorrence or to disgrace and contempt describes how awful it will be. Think first particularly about what it means to be a Jew who rejected Messiah. To be raised to eternal existence in a body fit for eternity. Only to know in the pit of your stomach you were wrong about everything, wrong about the most important things, and that you are now facing your maker and sustainer, the Messiah who came to forgive sin that was rejected by you. And now you stand before him, clothed only in the things that you did. And what will it be like to face that fury? You will not be proud of your accomplishments. There will only be great shame. How awful it will be to recognize these things too late. Make no mistake, everyone experiences a resurrection. Everyone exists forever. Everyone gets a body fit for eternity. Either an eternity in God's gloriously wonderful good presence, or to exist forever in the unendurable blast of the glory of God's justice. And people thinking about these things have scramble to come up with some post-mortem alternative for the wicked. I mean, if you don't make it to heaven, surely there's some other alternative, whether naturalism, it, it's just dust to dust. You become food for worms and poppies or annihilation. Maybe God will just eliminate people altogether who are wicked so they cease existing or maybe universalism. Maybe everybody just goes to heaven because it's so awful thinking about hell as a reality. Maybe there's a purgatory, you get purged for a while and then you get sprung after it's all taken care of or maybe reincarnation after you die, can you get a second chance? Maybe some self-determined state, you just get to decide what eternity is when you get there. Maybe some sort of post-mortem evangelism. Some Christians have proposed the idea that Jesus is going to stand there at the gates of hell and tell you, don't come in here, believe in me now and you get one last chance. All of those things are lies. Hebrews 9.27 is very clear. It is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. And the reality is this other resurrection that Daniel describes here only leads to what Revelation 20 calls the lake of fire. And in the lake of fire, there is a knowledge of heaven, a knowledge of what you missed out on. There is fire pain without relief, the wrath of God, a destruction that keeps on destroying, interminable darkness, terror, separation from all that is good and enjoyable in God, but very much present with the rule of God. It is said that the lamb and his holy angels are present there. According to the Bible, hell is real, literal, forever, irreversible, imminent, and final. If you are not a part of the first kind of resurrection, a resurrection unto life, the only inevitable result of your existence 
terminates in an eternity under God's just wrath. This is not a scare tactic of moralists. This is God's own promise. It means to partake in a wrath that you cannot resolve yourself to endure. A loneliness that you cannot cope with. A blackness you cannot get used to. A suffering you cannot take a break from. Can't be distracted from. Cannot daydream during. Cannot tune out. A suffering you cannot medicate, inebriate, or ameliorate. A discomfort that you cannot ignore as you go about your business. Because in eternity, enduring God's wrath will be your business. There will be no person, no thing, no thought to console you. The sentence will be to endure the unendurable, to bear the unbearable, to tolerate the intolerable, to be perpetually destroyed but never annihilated under the infinite weight of the glory of the justice and holiness of God. This is an unspeakable hopelessness and the darkest of despair. These two kinds of resurrection here in Daniel are consistent with the testimony of the scriptures. Jesus said in John 5, Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. They will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Revelation makes clear these two kinds of resurrections don't happen at the same time. They are in fact separated by a thousand years. Revelation 20 verse 5 says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. The first kind of resurrection described in Daniel 12 2 is a resurrection unto life. In Revelation uh, chapter 20 as a first resurrection over whom death has no power. That resurrection of great tribulation martyrs and I believe Old Testament saints occurs a thousand years before the second one. And during that thousand years, Christ reigns on the earth. Satan is bound. And all of that is followed by this second resurrection. By the way, there's not just two resurrection events in the Bible. There are many resurrection events, but there are only two kinds. A resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto eternal destruction. I can give you the last two points in 30 seconds. Or I can save them for next week. Let's go 30 seconds. The third feature of the, the end of the era of humanity on the earth is the saint's glorification. Look at verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who lived countercultural lives going against the grain of the way the world was going, even during that great tribulation period, there will be some who believe. There will be 144,000 marked out Jewish witnesses who cover the earth with the testimony about Christ. There will be two prophetic witnesses giving testimony of Christ. And there will be Gentiles who believe their message during that time. And all who lead others unto that righteousness in Christ, they will be set apart. They will be believers and against the grain in the midst of a perverse generation. Their reward will be to shine in glory. Shining in the radiant presence of God, and they will therefore shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heavens, like stars in the firmament. Romans 8.18 says, the sufferings of our present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed in us. And this section ends in verse 4 with the fourth element of this end of an era, the prophecy's preservation. As for you, Daniel... Conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth. Knowledge will increase. The closing of the book here, the sealing of the book is, is not shut the book of Daniel and don't ever read it. This is a command to preserve this prophecy so that people will read it. This is an instruction set, an encouragement for people who will experience these realities. 
We'll talk more about that word to close up. It shows up again later in Daniel 12. Uh, It does not mean to hide or to shroud in mystery. It just means to finish this writing, close the book, and preserve it for future use. It's much much like Jesus' instructions in Matthew 24 and 25 in the Olivet Discourse, or the details of Revelation 6 through 18, given specifically to the people who will be there, who will understand them, and they will be helpful to them. I think this is what Daniel means in verse 4 when he says, many will go back and forth. The word means to go here and there in search of something, and knowledge will increase. That is, there will be people, specifically those looking to give insight to others during those times, who will scour for information and find truth right here in Daniel 12. They'll find truth in Jesus' instructions to the tribulation disciples. In Matthew 24 and 25, they will find truth in the book of Revelation 6 through 18. Those things will make much more sense to them in that time. And God is kind to give them the answers and the encouragement that they will need. Let me bullet point for you some takeaways for our own hearts here. God has a purpose in afflictions. If God has a purpose for his people, a good purpose for his people during the very worst afflictions, argument from the greater to the lesser, you can count on the fact that God has your good in mind in any afflictions now too. He's already made that promise. But it is so demonstrable in the worst period of human history that God has good purposes in store for his people. Secondly, we see God's sovereignty in the worst period of history. This is a limited time frame. The Antichrist is on God's short leash. Satan can only do what God allows. All of this is God's purpose. Nothing's out of control. And listen, that will be the worst period of human history ever. And it is not out of control. Nothing's out of control now. Number three, the worst days are yet to come. So whatever optimism you have about the future, just... Cash that in. Secondly, the best days are yet to come. So every hope that you have built into this reality that Christ will come to earth, we anticipate his coming, we long for his appearing, that stone cut out without hands will come down and smash every human empire, and Jesus will set up his glorious kingdom on the earth and reign on the earth for a thousand years. That is good news. That will be the best era of human history ever. And that kingdom will not end and will usher in the glorious eternal state where there will be no sin, no death, no mourning, no sorrow, no sickness, no sadness, no tears ever, ever again. Good days are yet to come. The best days are yet to come. And then finally, one question. What are you attached to that God is committed to? To demolish. What does your heart gravitate toward that God has already set his timetable up to destroy? We just ought to hold loosely those things that turn God's stomach. We ought to hold loosely those things that are not necessarily sinful, but just temporal. We can make an idol out of any old thing. Knowing that all of it is coming to an inglorious end, it just helps keep our perspective on what we're building and why we're building it. Hold these things loosely. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are coming back. We thank you that you will reign. You will set all things right. Your shalom over the whole earth is coming. And we revel in the good news of that kingdom. May we proclaim it until you come in your name. Amen.